Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz, and this is the ninth year anniversary. A special joining me today, former WCW superstar, Mr. Lash LaRue, one of my favorite guests. Lash, what's going on? How you doing? John, how in the world are you, man? Congratulations on nine years. What a big deal that is. No small thing in any endeavor is certainly no small thing in the podcasting world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. What's going on in your world, Lash? What have you been up to? Man, I just came off of a whirlwind of a last quarter of the year. You know, with my business, with being caricatures and doing live events and that sort of thing, the holidays, once they start coming down the pike, man, it is fast and furious for me. And and you spark, sprinkle in there several conventions where I do digital caricatures now as well and been traveling a great deal, man, been doing a lot. So, Right now, at the beginning of the year, usually January is a reset for me, a much-needed breather, and an opportunity to get my feet back underneath me again before starting another year. I love it. The characters are awesome. You do a great job, so that's great that they keep you busy. Oh, yeah, very much so, man. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, especially around Christmas time, around the holidays, uh, once fall hits, man, it is a fast frenzy, but it's year round, man. Nobody stops having parties. Nobody stops having weddings. Uh, you know, these conventions that I have really started making my bread and butter, those corporate conventions and trade shows take place year round. So I'm constantly traveling. I'm on the road now, John, probably as much as I was when I was at WCW. Wow. That's amazing. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> racking up the frequent flyer miles again. I mean, yeah. you used to a fun thing about that, and I don't know if our, if our listeners care to hear about this, but it's funny to me being somebody that wrestled primarily, you know, before we really started hitting this smartphone error where everything has an app to it and is really streamlined travel. You know, I come from the old school, late 90s, early 2000s, man. They would literally FedEx you a booking sheet and you had an atlas and you knew you needed to get to that address and you had a paper ticket. You know, now I go through the airports, man, and I can follow my baggage on my apps. I can check in, you know, with my phone. I can do the same thing with my rental car, my for crying out loud, you go to a hotel now, you don't even need the key anymore. You just use your phone to unlock the door. It's crazy to me, man. And I know that makes me sound super old, but maybe I just am. <laughs> maybe, but the technology is crazy. It might be too much some, sometimes, some of this technology nowadays. Hey, it certainly made it much easier, you know. Now, when you're, you're doing that, like – Back in the day, I mean, the traveling and stuff. Who were some of like your big travel partners, or did you really just travel alone? No, 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 no. I had a I had a cadre, if you will, of of good travel partners, and it's always important that you find people that are like minded, that are similar uh, dispositions as yours. You know, people that you can get along with that really become your brothers because you're on the road with them more than you are you at home with your family. And for me, my number one travel partner was Brad Armstrong. Uh, he was my brother from another mother, man. And and anytime we were on the road together, he and I were, were the ones that were traveling. And uh, apart from that, and even sometimes along with that, was Nick Patrick. Referee Nick Patrick and I were super close. We always traveled together. Um, I traveled a pretty good bit with uh, Hugh Morris and, and Chavo Guerrero. We were a good little travel group together. Referee Johnny Boone was a part of that for a while. Uh, Mark Johnson, Slick Johnson was a part of that little travel group. Uh, did that a little bit. Traveled with Disco some. Traveled with uh, with Billy Kidman, Rey Mysterio, and, and uh, Conan. Not quite so much, but a little bit with those guys as well. But generally, more often than not, it was somebody with the last name Armstrong or it was Nick Patrick. I just saw, I don't know if you saw it, uh, Brian Armstrong, uh, Road Dog, just posted a picture of Brad uh, with Andre the Giant. And from far away, I thought it was Bullet Bob because he had the singlet and it had the weird, you know, the weird hair, the, the curly hair kind of thing. But I zoomed in and he said, it's my brother Brad. I was like, oh my God, it didn't look like him. I don't know if you saw that or not. I did see that photo, man. And, and I think to people that at first glance, I thought the exact same thing. But to people that really knew Brad, that is certainly a very young, baby-faced Brad. Brad had that natural curly hair, you know, and, and he had that – all those Armstrongs had sort of a natural perm to their hair anyway, which was yeah. perfect coming up through the 80s. 
you know. And and then, of course, uh, Brad, as he got older and matured a little bit more and grew out the beard, he had that phenomenal late 80s, early 90s Ronnie Van Zant thing going, you know, where you had the different color. Your hair is a little bit lighter than your beard is. <laughs> it was, it's, it's an awesome look. I love it. Very cool. I was like, wow, Andre the Giant and Bill Bob's like, oh, no, it's Brad. It's like, wow, pretty cool. Good picture. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a photo somewhere, man, of, of all those Armstrong brothers together, man. And it's, uh, it's a great photo, just a candid that was taken of them in their living room. And they're all kind of lined up, you know, in, in order of height. And, man, just such a top-notch family, top to bottom. I, I will always say I don't think that the Armstrongs get quite the flowers that they deserve in the wrestling business. They certainly get a lot of respect, and people love them. And How can you not love them, man? But – to me, you take that family when it comes to wrestling, and I'll put them up against anybody. I'll put them up against the Hearts. I'll put them up against the Von Erics. Uh, they just have such a powerful legacy. And what really, I think, strengthens that legacy, at least in my eyes, you know, we were talking about your podcast. I mean, you know how difficult it is just to do nine years and, and have something going that long and keep it relevant and keep it important and keep it out there in the space where people are paying attention to it. Well, imagine being a part of a wrestling family and you're able to take these guys and their careers stay relevant, not just for a five-year run or a six-year run or a 10-year run, but for 20, 25 years, make an entire legacy out of it. And we're not talking about one or two superstars from the family. We're talking about the entire family. That's impressive. Whether you're Scott Armstrong, Steve Armstrong, Brian, Brad Armstrong, Bullet Bob Armstrong, every one of them in their own right deserved to have a spot in the wrestling business and be well regarded and very well thought of. And then you take them as an entire family. I'll put them up against anybody, man. Oh, yeah. Do you still do the annual uh, pilgrimage to visit Brad? You still do that, right? Absolutely, I do. And in fact, I don't know for those that may follow us on social media, uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard and I missed each other this year but we still went separately and posted our own photos. Uh, generally, more often than not, Tom Pritchard and I will, will meet up at the exact same time right there in Marietta, usually early November, and we'll commemorate Brad and spend a little time together and spend a little time with our brother and our friend Brad Armstrong. And, uh, and it's always super important to me. And if I can't get there with Tom Pritchard, I'm still going to go on my own. And, you know, it's weird because – I'm not an overly sentimental guy. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not with that. I'm not like that with anybody else in my life. But Brad was so impactful on me and was such a, a, a legend in my eyes. And to then call him a friend and a brother in the same way, it's just, uh, it's, it's that important to me. And it's that big of a deal. And he's not somebody I discount easily. And I've explained it probably best to Dr. Tom Pritchard this way. I realize, man, I'm very self-aware and I realize everybody loved Brad. And Brad had a lot of friends. So I will never claim to have been Brad Armstrong's best friend, but Brad Armstrong was my best friend. And, you know, I'm a little bit like Wyatt Earp in, in the, old, uh, uh, the old movie there, or like Doc Holliday, rather, in the in the Tombstone movie, where he goes out there with Wyatt Earp and he's He's hunting down the guys that killed his brothers and attacked his family. And he's coughing and blood's coming out of his lungs and the whole deal. And the guys ask him, they say, Doc, why are you out here? And he says, because why hurts my friend? And the guy says, hell, I got lots of friends, Doc. And Doc says, well, I don't. You know, I've kind of felt that way. I have a tight circle of people around me. I, I like to think I get along with most anybody and there's not too many uh, people that have passed, you know, across me and in my time that, that I haven't been able to spend some time with, get to know and, and get along with just fine, man. I can work with anybody, spend time with anybody, connect with anyone. But as far as that close circle of people that I really consider brothers and those that I can count on in my life, I keep it tight on purpose because I think that that's important. And, and I think it cheapens friendships for you to just give that away freely to everybody and there not be some give and take. And, and Brad was always there for me. And we always, 
uh, our, our friendship did not depend on who was on TV at what time and, and who's under contract with this company and whether or not we were traveling on the road together. Our friendship surpassed all of that. And, and I want to, for the rest of my life, honor that as best as I possibly can. It's a great uh, movie, Tombstone. That's a great, yeah, good stuff great. there. Yeah. Tremendous. You know, Dr. Tom said the same thing about Brad. He didn't have many friends, but Brad was probably his best friend when he was you know, running up and down the road. So pretty, you guys are pretty much in line right there for sure. Well, you know, and the thing about it is too, pauses. I've had this conversation um, a few times with some other people and the older I get, the more I'm aware of it, um, especially now having stepped away from the wrestling business, but still having some connections back into it and ever so often running into some people. And I have found out in life, um, there are like-minded people in the wrestling business, you know, and, and there are like-minded people in life for that matter. And so often there are people that I have become friends with and become extremely close with pretty quickly, simply because we've had that mutual connection, that mutual friend. And Tom Pritchard, for instance, was one of those that he and I became friends because of our friendship with Brad, that mutual friendship. And it was like, uh, even before I knew Dr. Tom personally, it was like, I may not know Tom, but if Brad thinks that highly of him, then I ought to as well. And I think that feeling is mutual with Dr. Tom. And, and I think that that's been our bond between us is, you know, and you get that in the wrestling business. There are people I'll run into and I'll say, uh, well, I don't know this person, but because I know this other person and their friends, then I know we're going to get along just fine. How come Brad couldn't take like behind the scenes, how funny he was and all this other stuff. How come he couldn't do that? Like in front of the camera, as far as like be a wise ass because road dog, like, you know, it's such a good talker, he, maybe not as, as good of a worker. Obviously Brad was an awesome worker, but how come he couldn't bring that personality out and be like a real, the wise ass joke around guy that he was behind the scenes. You know, I actually asked Brad that, that question point blank. Um, I really did because I always was curious about the exact same thing. And, and he told me pretty straightforward. He said, uh, he goes, you know, Lash, I came across, man, I came into the business at a time, brother, when you just, especially if you were a baby face, it was a serious thing. And you had to be that white meat baby face and you had to be serious. And it wasn't ha ha. And most storylines for what they were, if you want to call them storylines, really they were issues and they were angles back then, right? When he first broke into the business. Yep. And so if you had an issue or an angle for it to draw money and for it to make sense, it wasn't really entertainment based. It was something personal and it was something, you know, serious and to be taken serious. And you really didn't have that many opportunities to do something that was just straight up entertainment. And especially if you add to that being the son of someone that was seen as serious and carrying as much authority and gravitas in their character as Bullet Bob Armstrong did. You know, Brad's introduction into the wrestling business was Bullet Bob's son. And so I think you add those combinations. I think he felt this uh, expectation to be a serious wrestler. And then you add to that the fact that he was such a great technical wrestler. It lended itself more to being serious than it did being some ha-ha comedy act. And I just don't think he gave it much thought. Brad was also one of those kind of people that he was happy to be working, man. He was happy to be relevant. And like everybody, I mean, you wouldn't be in the wrestling business if you didn't have some semblance of an ego and if you didn't want to be on top and if you didn't think you were capable of being on top. But Brad had charisma, but I think he cared more about the wrestling aspect of it. And I just don't – I think he saw that how do you take someone's character and get it across on TV is really somebody else's job. His job was to go out there and have great matches, and, and that's what he did. And it's just coming from a different era. And by the time Brian came along, you the not only did you have the shifting winds in the wrestling business, but I, you know I don't want to speak on behalf of Brian, but I feel like I know the family well enough to be able to say too. I would say Brian came into the wrestling business with a total different perspective. You know, he didn't come in traditionally as the whole legacy Armstrong wrestler so much as the guy that just got back from this big stint in the Marines and had seen a great deal of life in a very short amount of time and at a young age. And it became very real to him very quickly, I'm sure. And, and suddenly something like taking wrestling overly serious as opposed to just being myself and getting what I want out of life 
probably was not as much of a big deal as it would be to somebody that did nothing but, you know, lived, breathed, and ate wrestling. You know, Brian came in with an opportunity to to be getting into wrestling and to break into wrestling, but man, he had seen some other aspects of life by then. So I'm sure that that colored things a little bit more too, where he goes, you know, life is too short for me to not just go out there, have fun and be myself. Yep. Definitely. Now you mentioned another travel partner of yours, disco, disco Inferno. What was he like? Because you see, you know, a character on, online or maybe some of the things he said, maybe he's portrayed a, a little bit, maybe in the wrong light, but what is he really like? I think disco is that there's a, there's a certain uh, element of wrestlers out there that you just have to know how to take them and you got to know who they are. And if you can get past that, that veneer and that facade of, Hey, that's their personality. And it's like this with people in general out in life, right? You get underneath that and you go, okay, I'm going to assess whether or not I think this is a good hearted, good person, non-malicious person or not. And I can look at disco and, and first of all, I can discount the stuff that you see just on the surface where he's being sarcastic and where he's being, uh, uh, controversial and, and where he's saying some things that maybe the other people wouldn't say and they bite their tongue on, you know, you get underneath that and you get past just talking about wrestling and talking about the issues of the day. Disco's a good hearted person and I always found him to be a hard worker and somebody that was reliable and that you could count on. And we got along great because of that. And, and I saw past all the sarcasm and, and saw it as just him cutting up and that's his personality. And, and I don't I don't think he always gets a fair shake because of that. But he's also quick to give his opinions. I mean, you know, he, he's that type of personality. And I understand that. I get that. I think some of that is him playing into what he sees as his public persona as opposed to who he is in real life. But that's okay as well, you know. And, and, and that's the wrestling business for you. And I, I think sometimes we take things a little too seriously and, and we take – issues that are just storyline way too seriously and we don't see the people as who they are deep down inside and i judge people on how they treat me and disco was always great to me he was always fair to me he was always kind to me and i couldn't say anything bad about him because of that and then as far as from a wrestling standpoint comes from i think because people don't like his opinions he often gets a bad rap for being a cheesy throwaway character but for what his place was in the wrestling business at the time and for where he was on the wrestling card and for what he brought to the company versus what he's getting paid by the company, I think Disco was a tremendous talent and a great hand. If, if, if I was starting a wrestling company and it was that era of WCW, you know, I think Disco is good business for where he is on the card for what role he's playing for the talent he brings to a match. Was he somewhat limited? Possibly so, but he knew exactly what he could do and couldn't do. And he did try to get outside that wheelhouse. And you look at his matches, they were solid matches and entertaining, no matter who he went against. What more could you ask for if you're a wrestling promoter? I agree. I just feel like maybe because he's so opinionated and he could be harsh, which is yeah. kind of basically hitting you over the head with the truth, with a hammer. You know what I mean? It's like people don't like that. They just don't appreciate that. That's exactly right, and, and he's certainly not diplomatic, and, and I'll be honest, I'm the kind of person, I'm the exact opposite, Oz, man. My, my opinions are my opinions, but they're not so important to me that I'm going to get them across no matter what, uh, whether I care what you think or not. There's right. often times I have an opinion on something that's going on in the wrestling business that I just keep it to myself because, number one, I know it's going to be controversial, and number two, I'm not arrogant enough to think that somebody else is going to care what my opinion is on it. So, you know, why am I going to share something that's going to get me heat when it's really not going to move the needle on where wrestling fans are at large? When you look at, like, WCW at that point, there were so many good guys on the roster, but it was so top-heavy that sometimes those guys underneath never got through that quote-unquote glass ceiling. You know, maybe they did elsewhere, but in WCW it was so hard because you got Hogan and Luger and Sting and – DDP and Goldberg, it was just so hard. But Disco and yourself and, and Jericho at one point are all kind of those guys that were kind of stuck in between. They couldn't break through because all those guys had the political clout and the name value in WCW ahead of you guys. Sure. I think self-awareness matters so much in the wrestling business. And sometimes you can lose that because you're stuck in this bubble. And all you know is what you're trying to do with your character and in the, in the space that you're working in. 
So when you start seeing fans react to you and you start believing your own stick, so to speak, and you get a good following behind you and you maybe get a little heat, a little bit of a push, and, and something's driving you, you can start thinking a little too highly of yourself sometimes. And I'm not knocking people that do that. You have to do that in order to climb that ladder. But I said all that to say this, that perspective is a powerful thing. And the older I get, the more of it I have. And I can remember even being a young guy in my early 20s in WCW and buying into some of that and going, well, maybe there is this ceiling and, and how are we expected to break through and we need to be given some opportunities. And then one particular night I was at a Nitro that I was booked on but did not have a match. And I was still anonymous enough that I could stick my hair under a hat like I have now. And, you know, now I look like I've got short hair because it's all stuck underneath my hat and people don't recognize me right away. And I can go out there among the fans and I can watch this show from a fan's perspective. And I remember watching that show and seeing Kidman come out and get a great reaction and seeing DDP come out and the people go nuts and seeing the NWO come out. And of course it was that juggernaut that it was. And then I saw Hogan come out and it was a totally different reaction, similar to what we probably saw with The Rock making his return, you know, uh, on Raw. And when you see that and you feel that rumble in your soul and you felt those fans go crazy and that Road oh, yeah. Warrior-esque pop before and how it just vibrates throughout the arena, it's a different animal. And when you see that live, then you have to say to yourself, you go, uh, uh, okay, okay, you know, you may be getting a great reaction when you go out, but you're not getting that reaction that Hogan just now got that I just felt deep down in my soul. So it's kind of hard for you to argue with the powers that be that are after the bottom line and are chasing the ratings and are chasing that money and the profit and doing right by all the people that they have to answer to and, and put out the best product that they possibly can. You're going, okay, that guy's the top guy. So then what are your options? Your options then are to try to make yourself as undeniable as you possibly can, like someone like a Goldberg, because for all the people that can claim they were held down in WCW, you can't argue the fact that here comes the rookie Goldberg, who's able to come into the wrestling business and immediately shatter that glass ceiling. So the argument can kind of be made both ways. And you go, well, now, wait a second, though. We, we see what Jericho is now. And didn't WCW really drop the ball on that one? Uh, I don't know. Maybe or maybe the wrestling business was just such at the time where someone like Jericho had to leave and go someplace else and get a fresh start and get a new little shiny coat of paint on him and get an opportunity to present himself in a different way in order to make that next step to the next level. That's just a wrestling business, man. And uh, if I were in the wrestling business right now in my prime and really trying to make a name for myself and I was a young guy, I would look across the landscape and see all these different playgrounds that I could be involved in. And I would say, hey, I really like my chances that if things aren't going my way here, then I'm going to trust my talent and try over here. And if TNA doesn't have a place for me, maybe NXT does and WWE can see something in my future. And if they don't, maybe AEW has got an opening there that I just fit perfectly for, man. And you just don't know. I mean, wrestling is all about timing. It really truly is because when it comes down to it, either you have the talent to compete on that level or you don't. And if you do, then you're probably going to get an opportunity somewhere at some point. Then it's just a matter of what did you do with it? And was the timing good where you're against the right opponent in the right arena at the right moment? Are you CM Punk in Chicago coming back after eight years? You don't microwave eight years, right? You don't. It's just that that time away did him some good so that when he comes back, he has a different level of relevance and he has a different level of impact. And the fans are going to respond in a different way because of who he is and where he's at. And it's a restart for him. And, and I would, dare I say, to even take that, that theory and that thought a little bit further, I'm not sure CM Punk could have immediately come right back to WWE and garnered the type of respect and opportunity that he's going to get now as he did by coming back and making that AEW impact, courting all the controversy that came with it, uh, having the run that he had there, good, bad, or ugly, and now have the opportunity to come back to WWE in a different light, in a different vein, and, and reestablish whatever legacy he may leave there. 
good on him. Now you're about the same age as Punker, and you just yeah. wrestled recently. Are you planning on continuing to wrestle? Well, you know, we'll see what happens, man. Uh, I feel really good about what happened, John. I really, truly do. I didn't know what to expect because you take a long layoff, and it really does do a lot to you. And uh, the only thing I could do was get myself ready mentally and physically for it. I did not. I had not been in the ring for 13 years when I went and did GCW Whoa. and wrestled Joey Janela. And I legitimately can say, without training, I didn't go and train. I didn't work out in the ring. I didn't take some bumps to prepare myself for it. I went to that show, sat down with, with those guys and said, yeah, let's do this thing. And went out and had a 15-minute match without blowing up, without feeling like I had to hold back, still doing the splits, still doing suicide dives, still doing the whiplash off the top rope to people through doors, you know, still doing stuff outside the ring. And, and felt great about it, man. Physically left there feeling wonderful. And I really think that wrestling is one of those things, man, it's either in your blood or it's not. And uh, I wasn't certain about that before I went and had that match. After I had the match and I rolled out of the ring, I felt better about it than I did before. You've known me well enough now to know, man, I'm not an arrogant guy. I don't blow myself up. I don't try to promote myself on social media to say I'm the next big thing and you guys are crazy for not booking me. But I felt so good about that when I left that match that now I'm sort of picking my shots, man. Um, I have a very successful caricature business that I'm extremely happy with, and I bring something to that space that nobody else does, and I'm doing really well financially with it. So it's going to take some stuff for me to come back to the wrestling business, but I think I have a lot to offer to it. And so if the right opportunity comes with the right company and I have the opportunity to do some things that I think – are worth my effort and worth my physicality and putting my body back out there in that way and really going through the grind again, I would love to do it. I love the wrestling business. It doesn't leave you. Being able to tell those stories in the ring, regardless of what era you're in, doesn't change. The psychology remains the same. So I think I bring a good mind to it. I think I still have all the physical abilities that I had before. I can go out and have great matches. My matches would only get better the more I do it again. But at the same time, I'm comfortable enough and now in my skin that I'm in a different place than I was. When I was in my 20s, man, I just wanted a job and I was happy to have a job. And you didn't want to mess up those opportunities when you're young and you're afraid of certain things because of that. I'm at a point now in my career, I had so much fun with that match with GCW because the company themselves in that locker room was so welcoming and so awesome to me. And because... I was so self-aware, man. Instead of going out in the match and having tunnel vision and going, I can't mess this thing up and I don't want to screw up this opportunity, I went out there looked around and saw an arena full of fans that were going, you still got it, and, and remembering wow. me that I was in the moment in a way I never was previously in my career. And I enjoyed it so much. I had so much ring awareness. I knew exactly where I was at all times. We hit those marks. We didn't botch anything. We didn't miss anything. I had a great opponent I was out there with that I could work well with. Uh, there was nothing about that experience, man, that I could say anything negative about. Now, the only reason why fans have not seen me pursue that more aggressively is uh, simply because I haven't seen the doors quite open. If those doors open, man, I'll, I'll jump right through them. You know, and, and, and if they're not there, I'm okay with that too. You know, I went to that match literally telling the people around me that I go, if this is the start of uh, Lash LaRue making a big comeback and I make that one more run, I want my day in the sun and one more run and I ain't done, I ain't done, I ain't done. Hey, if that's what it is, I'll grow the sideburns out and we'll all make some money and we'll have some fun with it. And if that's not what it is, then I'm perfectly comfortable taking all that new gear that I had made for that pay-per-view taking those new tights with that new double L floor to lead logo that I created, put them in a shadow box, hang them on the wall and say, Hey, it was a great run. I'm okay. Either way, man. I love it. That That's great. Hopefully see you wrestling uh, more as we hit the wind down here, head towards the finish. Where can everybody find you book? You get some character caricatures. See you. Where can everybody get you? Man, I'm low key and I'm easy. You can find me on X at last can draw. So that means I can draw for you physically if you have me at your at your events and you want me to do caricatures or if you got some commission work 
that you want me to do is some illustrations, then I can draw. And if you want to book me on a wrestling show or an autograph signing, I can draw. I'll draw a crowd for you. So you can find me on X at Lash Can Draw, or you can just email me directly, lashwcw at aol.com. Yes, that is an actual email address that I still have after 25 years. All right, Lash, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John, and congratulations again, man. Nine years. Let me hear you tell about it.